here we are. We are in the last week of what does the Bible say about blank. So we have a few more questions we want to answer that you guys submitted to us. So first, Jason, I want to ask you about denominations. Are denominations still Christian if they're Bible beliefs? And what the person's wondering about is things like Jehovah's Witness and Mormonism and stuff like that. Sure. So, uh, yeah, denominations, uh, they're, they're not really in the Bible. Uh, uh, but what we will see is that denominations kind of began because men will interpret Scripture in different ways and in different views. And, and that's essentially why you have so many different denominations. Uh, <clears throat> we say here at Family Life Church that uh, in the essential beliefs, we have unity. In the non-essential beliefs, we have liberty. And in all those other factions, we, we have love. So uh, for those that deviate, such as Jehovah's Witnesses and uh, Mormons, we still love those, those uh, men and women that are a part of that. Uh, but we, we want to have unity in what Jesus says and what the Bible says about him. All right, so this question is about different races and different people groups. And can Adam and Eve account for all of these different ethnicities? Yeah, so the question is, in a creation story, how can Adam and Eve account for all the different races and colors of people on the earth? And the answer is yes, they can. It just is, deals with genetics, which can be very complicated. But what we need to understand is that Adam and Eve, they were probably some kind of mixed race. And in the case that they weren't white, they weren't black. And they were somewhere in the middle. And over time, when the children were born, you'd have certain colors made with the colors that look the most like them, and that's how it kind of accounts for the different races. You can also look at the Babylon story, or the Tower of Babel in Genesis, where God separates the people, and they ended up going to different parts of the world. It's kind of a fascinating story, and you know, so long ago, we don't really have a lot of details about how it happened, but the biblical account is very interesting, so you can read about that in Genesis, or just Google Tower of Babel story. Yeah, and it's just melatonin, right? It's just, it's just color. So. That's right. So the third question has to deal with repentance and why repentance? Yeah, so a very important aspect to Christianity. John the Baptist preached on it. Jesus preached on it. You can see in uh, Matthew chapter 4, he says, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repentance is important because it's reconciling us to God. And repentance simply is just, if you're, doing, uh, if you're down one path, you're simply turning around. You're turning an about face and you're stopping whatever that is. Um, it's important to, to do it with the right heart and to just simply do an about face whatever, whatever path you're on. We also had two questions, one that dealt with depression and anxiety and another one that had to deal with marriage and divorce. We answered both of those questions last year, so if whoever asked those questions, we encourage you to go to ocalflc.com and you can look under the messages and you'll find a series from last summer called Courage, where we talk about depression and anxiety. So we encourage you to listen to those messages to get a more in-depth, detailed answer for this question. And then as for divorce and remarriage, if you go back to last year when we did this series, What Does the Bible Say About Blank? You'll find a message that has to deal with marriage. So we encourage you to go back there and, and to get that answer. But that's all for this year. Now get ready for the sermon. Well, good morning. So our mission here at Family Life Church is to connect families to life. And today we're going to look at what the Bible says about sexuality and how God has designed it to help us live the best life possible. But first, I just want to say a good morning welcome. My name is David, and of course I'm the executive pastor here at Family Life Church. And we got um, the questions, of course, that we had you fill out a few weeks back. Uh, some of them were in reference to human sexuality. Uh, you've heard of the LGBTQ question. Well, we decided that we would approach that with a blanket approach. And so we're going to talk about human sexuality in, in a totality framework. And hopefully we answer the questions that, uh, in, in a way that you'll, you'll glean what you need from that. So to start off with, I want to tell a sex joke. No, I'm just, I'm just messing with you guys. So you guys are like, oh, this is going to be really uncomfortable. No. But let's look at why is this important to talk about? You know, why talk about sexuality in a church? Well, I think it's very important because our culture and also inside the church, we see where we have a lot of issues when it comes to sexuality and being able to have self-control. Like, for example, this is a, you know, we looked at some studies, and one study found that at least three out of every five women have experienced sexual harassment at work. And the people who did the study think it's actually much higher because 
80% of sexual harassment does not even get reported. So that's a problem that we have in our culture. And sexual harassment is just simply whenever somebody asks for a sexual favor that they did not want. Another study found, this is really sad, y'all, that 20 to 25% of women have cheated on their spouse. Excuse me, men have cheated on their spouse. And 10 to 15% of women have cheated. That's not good, y'all. And then another study that I found very fascinating, it just kind of shows how quickly our view of sexuality is changing in our culture, is that um, one study found that one out of every three people born after the year 1999, and this is what we're talking about, Gen Z, will identify as something other than heterosexual. But let's move it away from just cultures in general, and let's move it into the church. What are some statistics about the church? Well, one thing that's we find is that the church has been a force for both good and for bad. What is the good? Well, the good is actually marriage intimacy. I think this is fascinating. The study found that churchgoers have a 35% less chance of having a divorce. I mean, that's something to celebrate. Like, we can get excited about that. That's awesome. But what's the bad? What's the hurt? Well, this is interesting. The hurt is that when the study was done of Americans they found that 37% of Americans felt Christianity had a negative impact on sexuality compared to only 26% who felt it had a positive impact on sexuality. Now, why is that? I mean, I think that's a problem. I mean, I think that Christianity should be the light of the world. I think Christianity, the church, should be the example for others of how they want to be. But statistics show that the church is failing in that job. But, you know, you think about the sex scandals that have rocked the church world. You know, we're talking about systematic, you know, sexual abuse inside the Catholic Church and with the priests and how they covered it up. And then also inside the Southern Baptist Convention where like 700 women were sexually abused and they just swept it, up, um, swept it under the rug. When that comes out in the news, that builds a lot of distrust of culture when it comes to the church. And really, it paints a terrible picture of what Jesus is about. And one study even found that 12% of pastors have had an affair. That's a problem. We have to do better as a church if we're going to change the way that culture views sexuality and if we're going to change the way that the culture views our God. So I think it's important that we talk about this. And in many churches, it's still kind of taboo. Like, you know, sex is like that three-letter word people don't like to talk about in church. Like, he said sex, right? And, and, but I think it's important that we have this conversation in the church because it is taboo. And it's very important because sexuality, it touches so many different aspects of our life and in our culture. So I think it's important that we look at what does God have to say about this? And also that we self-reflect on what are some of the things that the church is doing right and what are some of the things that the church is doing wrong. So I want to take the next couple of minutes and look at what are some of the things that the church, when I say the church, I'm not talking about just family life church. I'm talking about the big C church, like the North American, we'll, we'll call it the North American church, okay? What are some of the things that we get right? What are some of the things we get wrong? I think the first thing we get right is that I think it's good that we emphasize that women dress modestly so you don't cause men to lust. But where's the wrong? The wrong is that we tend to make excuses for men's sexual promiscuity. And I've seen this in the church growing up, where it seems like people in the church are quick to label women who come in and maybe they dress a little loose, right? But yet, it seems to be this double standard where that same person who criticizes a girl for not dressing modestly will make excuses for why her son is going around and, you know, trying to get women to do stuff with them. And they'll say, oh, that's just boys being boys. And I think in this church world, we've seen a double standard where women seem to be the defenders of sexual purity, where men are seen as the attackers and trying to tear down those walls. But if we're going to change the way culture sees the church and if, to give an accurate picture of who our God is and God's standards for sexuality, we got to understand that there is no double standard that standard for sexual purity is the same for both men and for women. we got to stop making excuses for men and their sexual problems. Amen. Today. That's right. It's like, boom, it's getting real. <laughs> the second right, I think, is just that sex is to be reserved for the confines of marriage. I mean, I think Scripture points to that. But what do we get wrong? What we get wrong is that we withhold compassion and shun people who don't wait. I remember back when I was in high school in our youth group, our keyboard player in the youth group band ended up getting pregnant. And 
the youth group in the church, this, it wasn't this church, this was, you know, well before this church launched, but this church, it turned its back on that girl. And that girl left the church hurt. And I think she was out of the church for something like 10 years because of that hurt. Imagine how things may have been differently if the church would have reacted differently to when that news came out. I don't know about you, but, you know, I got a kid on the way. I want to raise my kid in the church. I'm sure this girl felt the same way, but she felt so judged and so hurt that she felt like she couldn't even step foot in the church anymore. She felt condemned. Is that how we should treat people? I mean, all of us do things that if everyone knew our business, we'd be ashamed. We, you know, people might would look at us differently, right? So why do we treat others as though they have to be perfect to come to church? That's not what God teaches. What's the next thing we get right? And I think one thing that overall the church gets right is that homosexuality is not the way that God wants us to live. I think scripture points to that very clearly. But what's something that we get wrong? I think the church has really done a lot of harm when it comes to the, you know, the homosexual community. I think there's a lot of distrust between the two because... I think that churches have held up this idea that people with same-sex attraction have no hope for God's grace and that the church has treated people with homosexual tendencies as though they're subhuman, which makes it really tough when somebody who maybe was raised in church starts to feel the same-sex attraction is starts making these ideas that they have to be hush-hush about and that they can't be open and honest. And so there's only two options. Either you leave the church or you just hide it and you live a lie. And you don't tell anyone about it. That creates a lot of distrust. But when churches can be open and honest and have conversations, we can understand that, hey, listen, all of us are made differently. And we, you know, and I think that it helps people come to the front and say, okay, listen, this is something I'm struggling with. And then we can say, hey, listen, let's, let's work this out. Let's talk about it. It's got really quiet in here. And what's the last thing that I think we get right? This one's a little more lighthearted. I think one thing we get right is that sex is designed by God. Whoop, whoop, yeah. <laughs> Man, that was a little loud over there. <laughs> but what does the church get wrong? And this is something that I think is, has changed, obviously, in the last 50 years. But uh, uh, there used to be a notion in the church that sex can't be fun and that it's just for procreating. Well, I can tell you, sex can be fun. So um, and it's okay for it to be fun. But we're going to talk about, you know, the boundaries for sex and stuff like that in a little bit. But I think you want something to share. Uh, sexuality flavors everything about us. We got to do better. <laughs> sexuality flavors everything about us. Now listen to this. Standards in the Bible do not enhance God. They enhance our lives. Let that sink in for a moment. Uh, in, in the scriptures, we have what's called the S word. You know what the S word is? Uh, sin. Okay? The word sin in the Greek language is called hamartia. Hamartia is, um, it literally means to miss the mark. Now, to understand that correctly, you think about a target. You know how a target is? You have the larger circle. Wow, there's one right there. Okay, so you, you have the larger circle, and then a smaller circle inside that, and it keeps getting smaller until you get to the very center. And the center we call the bullseye. Sin. The word hamartia means that you're out here on the perimeter. You're not anywhere near the bullseye. Okay? God wants us to hit the bullseye. Now, when I was uh, younger, I had a bow, and I, I uh, taught a little bit of archery and had some people instruct me with it. And one of the first things you do if you're going to shoot a bow and arrow is you have to plant your feet well. And so with your feet planted well, you, you Position the arrow correctly on your bow, and then you begin to pull back on it. Remember, keep your feet solid. All right, then you need to know how to aim it. Different bows have different ways to aim, but you got to get the aim right. Hold it steady, and then you release it. Now, those that are really good archers, they've got their bows set up balanced so they can just allow the bow to just kind of ease forward. All right. 
No instructor has ever said, just, you know, shoot in that general direction. You'll get close enough, don't worry about it. But yet when it comes to sexuality, that tends to be the picture, especially in the culture. Now, as Christian people, we need to look at that bullseye that God wants us to have what Jesus called life abundantly. And when we hit that bullseye, that's the direction we're moving, to life abundantly. We don't just flail away, just sort of generally shooting in that direction. No, we want to hit it directly. Um, let me give you another illustration. You go to a fairly nice restaurant, and you go to the salad bar, as you're standing there looking at the various items on the salad bar, you see three or four roaches. And of course, you look at it and say, nobody's perfect. Don't worry about it. I don't think so. <laughs> you can look at those roaches and say, you know, I don't think I'm going to have a salad today. You know, matter of fact, I don't know. I'm not so sure I'm even, even hungry. <laughs> we need to have that same uh, approach when it comes to uh, sexuality. We don't want to have anything less than the bullseye, God's design for us. You know, uh, s s similarly, you go to a restaurant and you're getting ready to put a little bit of salt on your burger and you take the bun off and getting ready to put salt and you see three or four maggots just kind of enjoying themselves. You close it up and say, protein, don't worry about it. I don't think so. I think you're going to find a trash can for that burger and you're probably going to want to have a word or two with a manager of that restaurant. Well, again, the same approach let, let's have a, a sense of fidelity to what God says. Let's hit the bullseye. Let's don't have that general approach that really takes us to know where we really want to be. Yeah, no, I think this is really good talking about sexual standards. Um, one thing that I think is fascinating that in the New Testament church, when the church is starting to get off the ground, they're starting to reach people who were not Jews. And so we call these, you know, people the Gentiles. Most of us are probably Gentiles. Um, and so we can thank the early church for, you know, their reach into the Gentile world, but we have these people who have no church background, and all, all of a sudden, they're turning to God, and so the church leaders said, hey, listen, what are we going to do? Like, what standards are we going to have for people who are coming to Christ? And they said, let's do four standards. Now, those four standards could have been anything. It could have been like, you have to be in a small group, and you have to go through Connect Point and serve. If you're going to serve, you're going to serve one, attend one. You know, it could have been 10% tithe. That's what we want to see, 10%. You could be a Christian follow the pastor on Instagram, I mean, anything, right? But one of the four standards that they chose for people who are coming to Christ was actually sexual purity. That's how important the early church leaders thought it was. And Paul actually writes about this in 1 Corinthians. He's writing to the early church, and we get this passage that talks about why it's so important to have sexual purity. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to 1 Corinthians 6. If it's not, we have it up here on the screen for you. But Paul, he writes to his first century audience, and he writes, the body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with the prostitute? Well, never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with the prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh." But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. So we see this idea that when we sleep with somebody, it's something more than just physical. There's a spiritual dynamic with it, which is why it's so important that we don't sleep with the New York Patriots fan. Okay, y'all? Of course, that's a joke. I guess everyone here is New York Patriots fans. But still, let's see what Paul says next. He gives us a command that I think is so vital for us to learn how to live this life right. He says, flee from sexual immorality. Look at your neighbor and tell them, run, Forrest, run. <laughs> he goes on, he says, all other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Amen. Now, 
And this week in our life groups, when we get together, we get to, we're going to unpack this passage even further, and we're going to read what comes before it and what comes after it. So this week in your life groups, you're going to have a lot of fun getting to dive into this more. But what I think we can look at, and going back to the target analogy, is that sexuality's bullseye is simply to honor God with your bodies. What about some application? Okay. Uh, in your notes, you'll see where it says, how to win against sexual immorality. Number one is to avoid compromise. Avoid compromise. You see, the goal is what we'll call purity of mind. All right, with that, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. This is in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. And what scripture presents to us is that we can call it a battle of the mind. It's flesh versus spirit. Uh, If you go to a fried chicken joint and go and enjoy a whole bucket of that wonderful fried chicken, no problem. But you start doing that every day, guess what? Yeah. See, uh, let let me put it to you this way. Uh, If you have an impure thought that comes into your mind, and you resist against it and, and, and try to not let it just find a place in your, your, your thought processes. You know, the, you can't control everything that comes into your mind. It's like a bird that flies over. Any of you ever had your vehicle spotted before? Yeah. Uh, you can't control that. You know, birds will, will, will drop where they want to. But you can prevent that bird from building a, a nest on top of your head. Okay, so we don't do things that will cause us to get involved with a, a mental thought life that's, that's just wrong, that's filled with lust, that's filled with impurity. We don't do this. Now, l- listen to me very, very closely and, and understand this. Society, the one that we live in today, is stacked against a pure mindset, I tell you what, when you go and you, you watch the, the programming on TV, the stuff that they promote and they present as normal, when God said that's not the way it's supposed to be done, it's all around us. And so it, it's, it's like a, a toxic element. If we want to have a, a pure mindset, we can't allow that to rule in our minds. Uh, there's a certain sense that we have a prideful approach to a lot of the sexuality and this is the position it will take, that uh, I can get close to this stuff and I can tell when uh, it's, it's getting like I, I, it shouldn't be and I'll just simply back off and I won't let it uh, continue. All right, l- listen to me very closely. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, 18, said to run, run from sexual immorality. Run from sexual temptation. Don't fight it. Very simply, we are sexual creatures. And if we don't do like the scripture says and run from it, it has a way of sucking us into doing things that later reflect back and say, I wish the good I had not done that. So not letting pride to have a venue to, 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 to become a... Uh, allow sexual thinking to become a bigger part of our life. We, we need to make sure we don't allow that. Um, there was a time uh, I was out of college just a couple of years, and uh, I was living in Orlando, and I went up to the panhandle where my, my parents lived, where I'm from. You remember where Hurricane Michael went through and devastated the panhandle? It went right over my high school, blew away the gymnasium, but I was visiting with my parents, and uh, when it came time to head back to Orlando, I decided I'd go back a day early. So I left there, and I was heading back toward Orlando, and I always would come through Ocala. 
And when I got south of Ocala, half hour or so, there was a road, that, that the one that I was on, there was a like a, a bar or something. And it was getting a little bit late in the day, and it had these flashing signs that said, girls, girls, girls. And here I am. I've dedicated my heart and my life to Jesus. I've finished, you know, I, I crammed four years into five. It's a lot easier to do that way. But I spent five years in Bible college seeking the Lord. And here I am out here by myself. I've got a day to kill. Nobody's going to call me into account because I'm a day ahead. There's nothing to keep me from pulling off the road and hand, head into that little uh, business that had the signs, several of them flashing, girls, girls, girls. I was really struck by how the temptation, it just swelled up. It seemed to just grip me. I held my steering wheel tight. I said, God, help me. Because everything it seemed about me, physically, my, everything was saying, pull off the road, go check it out. It was just, to, to give you a picture, it, it was just like consuming. But I just gripped my steering wheel. I kept driving. Now here's the thing that was amazing. When I had passed that place, Maybe three or four miles down the road, all that temptation just vanished. You see, there, there's a principle in Scripture that the Scripture gives a picture of how demonic spirits will reign in an area and have a tremendous influence over certain ge geographical areas. And as I got close to that bar that was advertising girls, 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 it's like there was a demonic presence that almost took me over, trying to get me to leave the road. This is what it comes down to. If you are positioning yourself in an arena of extreme temptation, get out. Flee, the Bible says. Flee immorality. Don't hang out in that area. Get away from it. You want to be successful. In fighting off immorality. Sexual immorality does not have to be a part of our lives. I say it again. It does not have to be a part of our lives. We can live in purity. But we need to have that battle mindset. That we're going to do what we're going to do. And we're going to make our lives shine for the Lord. Dave? Yeah, no, that was great. Um, and so the first step to win the battle against sexual immorality is just don't you know, give up that fight. Um, the second step, and I think this is so incredibly important for people to live out, is to have an accountability partner. An accountability partner is just someone who you can be open and honest with and say, hey, listen, man, I went to this website. Hey, listen, you know, I'm, I'm feeling, str I'm struggling in my marriage. An accountability partner is just someone you can be open and honest with. Now, for some people, it may be your spouse. For others, it could be a best friend, a brother, a sister, whoever it may be, but it's important that you get an accountability partner. If you don't have anyone who can be that accountability partner, you know, get someone in your life group, someone who you can know, you can trust, who can follow up with you, and you, you can be open and honest with. I love what Solomon writes about this in Ecclesiastes. Um, Solomon writes that two people are better than one because they get more done by working together. If one falls down, the other can help them up. But it is bad for the person who is alone and falls because no one is there to help. Because the truth of the matter is, is that sin thrives in isolation. I think we can understand how this kind of works, right? I think this works in the sense where, you know, maybe your spouse is away on a business trip, so you're home all alone. And you get a little bored at night, and so you text your ex, Hey, what you up to tonight? I'm bored. Entertain me. Ooh. You know, maybe you're that person away on the business trip. There's no one around that you know. So you have that freedom to go and explore, you know, some of those fantasies that maybe you have had. The truth of the matter is, is that in isolation is when it seems that sin has the strongest hold on you, kind of like you were sharing when you're going on your way down to 
Orlando. But it's important for us to have those people that we can be open and honest with to help us stay strong when we get to those places when temptation is really strong. And, you know, one thing, one study shows that even inside the church, you know, about 50% of men struggle with pornography, which really, when you look at pornography, why is it bad? Is because it's an intimacy killer. Like, literally, it, it causes the way you think, kind of like you're talking about Romans, you know, 12, about change the way you think. It literally causes you to look at women as pieces of flesh who just satisfy your, you know, your sexual fantasies. So it just kills, it's a marriage killer, it's an intimacy killer. So it's not something that's healthy. And, uh, but one, a couple tools that will help people in order to fight this, we have them, we'll put them up on the screen for you. Um, there's one called X3 Watch, and then there's another one called Covenant Eyes. Um, and you can write them down in your notes. It's called X3 Watch and Covenant Eyes. And these two apps will help you by whenever you go to a website or you search on Google for something that's probably something you shouldn't be, you know, looking at, it'll send an email off to a couple of your friends so that they can follow up with you and let you know about it. You may say, well, I have to pay for that. Like, yeah, I mean, I think it's worth every penny, though, in order to beat an addiction like that. We're talking about healthy marriages. And the third step in order to defeat sexual immorality, and this one's a little bit odd, but simply get married. I know that's not what you hear about a lot, but simply get married. Hey, we'll do it right after church today, man. Um, and in 1 Corinthians, it's actually kind of interesting because Paul tells the people, he literally tells them this. He says, if they can't not control themselves, they should marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. So maybe you have kids or grandkids or maybe yourself you're in kind of like that dating age group. Um, marriage is, a, is the boundaries that God gives us to explore our sexuality in. Now, when you do get time to tie the knot, or as Beyonce would say, to put a ring on it, um, there are a couple tips that you need to understand. And first and foremost, don't get married just to have sex. Like, if you do that, you're setting yourself up for failure. Um, I was going to go somewhere, but I decided it probably would not be best to go that direction. But let's look at this idea that when it does come time to choose a spouse, um, in the Jewish tradition, there's this idea between compassionate love versus companionship love. Compassionate love versus companionship love. And the way this works is that in compassionate love, this is based on feelings. You know that idea, like, you know, when you first, you know, meet that person and you're attracted to them, you feel those, that, that sense inside, it like burns. You're like, ooh, I like this, right? You know, it's the hormones they're acting up. And then, you know, the first time you go and you talk to them, there's that uncertainty, right? Compassionate love is built on uncertainty, it's the unknown. You know, the first time you get to hold hands with them, you know, you flirt with them a little bit. You know, it, it, it excites you. It's like, what's going to happen? And so a lot of people, they get addicted to this idea of compassionate love. And because they love that person so much, well, they do. They'll go ahead and marry them. So that, that's their person exclusively. Compassionate love is great. I mean, as God designed us to enjoy sex, right? God in, designed us to be attracted to other people. But the problem is, is that they lean only on compassionate love. They don't look at companionship love. Because the truth is, and those who have been married, who I've, who I've talked to, plenty of people have been married, and they say, you know, after a few years, you know, that beauty kind of fades a little bit. Like, you don't care about it if your spouse is incredibly beautiful, you know, and you learn all those different things so that compassionate love starts to fade, what happens when that love gets low? Then it becomes a lot more tempting to look for that compassionate love with somebody else. The next thing you know, you'll find yourself like Tiger Woods being chased by your wife with a golf club because you've been sneaking around. You can't base a marriage just on compassionate love. You need to look at companionship love. When you look at companionship love, you're looking at values. I've talked to plenty of husbands and wives at this church who their spouse did not have the same standard when it comes to their faith. And they come to church alone with their kids and they hate it. They hate it that their spouse stays home. If you're not married yet, make that a priority. Is the person you're going to marry, they're going to come to church with you. What about things like raising the kids? Are you guys going to share the same values? Are you going to spank your kids or not, right? You know, are, do you hold the same standards when it comes to finances? I mean, that's one of the biggest things, right? Do you guys hold the same standards when it comes to how you get toothpaste out of a bottle? Like, these are, you know, maybe that's a smaller thing you can figure out, you know, regardless. But still, we need to look at what are the values that this person carries. Because when that compassionate love starts to drain, that companionship love rises. And you love that person for who they are and not what just 
not what they do for you. Compassionate love versus companionship love. When we can get companionship love along with compassionate love, you're setting yourself up for a successful marriage. Now, I know some of you guys may be thinking, companionship love, that sounds boring. I don't want a boring marriage. There was actually a study that was done, and this, I mean, this straight, University of Chicago did a study, and they found for American couples after 10 years of marriage, and this is crazy, y'all, but after 10 years of marriage, Christian couples have the best sex. Like, really? No, you're making that up, David. No, it's in there. I, I can give you the link later. Christian couples have the best sex after 10 years. And they look at the Christian theology, you know, we looked at scriptures where it says that you were wonderfully and beautifully made, that you are a masterpiece. The psychological health that gives to couples helps them even 10 years in to know that, that they are still wonderfully and beautifully made and helps them to enjoy more intimacy in the marriage. You know, um, the standard set for sexuality in the Bible is uh, it's very different from culture. Very different from culture. Uh, after I left Lakeland, left Bible college, and went to this church in Orlando, there was a gentleman there that I met. We're still very good friends. My wife and I met with he and his wife uh, this past Friday and had lunch with them. But uh, prior to him getting married, they, they're from Ohio, he said that uh, he lived a life that was uh, pretty rascally when it comes to sexuality, what have you. And uh, he said that he looked at me, and, and he said, Charles, your generation is the most promiscuous generation we've ever known. And he said, I, I, I just don't see how you walk in sexual purity. And so uh, I, I began to think about that, you know, what, what is there? Because I had committed myself to Jesus and had tried to do what I, I could to walk in sexual purity. And I began to pray and ask the Lord God what, what it's... Because uh, so, something was working, you know, besides just my commitment, which I had a commitment to honor God. But uh, some things that I began to, to see, one was that uh, the Bible says to avoid the appearance of evil. So if you have put yourself... In, in a scenario that's not like it should be, get out of that. Don't have anything to do with that. And so um, God gives grace where we are pursuing his face. He will give wisdom, and you'll be able to rise and walk into a level of purity that you know the Spirit of God is calling us to. Now let, listen to this. Culture says, do what feels right. Do what feels right. God says, do what is right. Okay, now, God's standards are out there if we'll just seek God in the Scripture. Culture says, sex is just physical. God says, it's much more. It's much more than just physical. And what we need to do is to set our face like a flint that we're going to honor God in everything about our lives. It's a choice. Are we going to honor God? Or are we going to fulfill some momentary pleasure that we will always look back on with, with a sense of regret? And when we look at human sexuality, because humans are curious people, right? We love to experience new things. God created us to be sexual creatures. So we love exploring these things. But what are the boundaries? Like we said, the boundaries is marriage. And the beautiful thing is, you know, you think about the analogy between fire and sex. You know, fire is an awesome substance. It, you know, historians look at fire and they say, you know, when humans were able to control fires, what led to the rise of civilizations. You know, fire provides warmth in the wintertime, provides energy so we can use its power. But we also know that fire, if it's outside the right environment, what happens? It becomes destructive. It takes out entire cities. And the same is true with the sex. Sex is a great thing. Sex is designed by God. It brings intimacy. It brings life. But we also know that sex outside the environment that it's meant for can be destructive. 
studies show, and this, I thought this is actually quite interesting, I'm a studies guy, but studies show that there is a correlation between being able to experience intimacy in marriage and how many sexual partners you have. And they find that the couples who have had the least amount of sexual partners before marriage tend to have um, lower rates of divorce. And I think there's something to this whole scriptural roles for, for sexuality. I mean, I don't, like we said earlier, these standards are not to benefit God. God is a perfect God. We can't add anything to God. We can't take away anything from God. So these standards that we see in the scripture, it's not for God's good, it's for our good. Because God wants us to enjoy sexuality. God wants us to explore the, the, those things that makes, us, makes it so much fun. But God also wants, knows what's the best way for it to be. God is the designer of sex, so who's the best one to say how it can be used? Probably the designer, you know, just saying. But as we start to conclude, you know, this talk is not something that most people enjoy hearing about, right? I mean, this is one of these topics that's, like I said, it's very taboo for a lot of churches to talk about this. It makes us feel uncomfortable because this is something that has a big part in our lives. And truth of the matter is, when you look at statistics, I mean, statistics show that you know, pretty much, I think something like 97% of Americans struggle in this area. You know, 97% of Christians um, haven't followed God's standard. So we're all in the same boat here. But I think there has been damage done by the church where people feel like they can't be open and honest about this subject. You just figure it out on your own. There's been a lot of people who have been ostracized from the church because of things they've done in this arena. My Jesus says I've come to bring life and to bring it to its fullest. As a church, how are we gonna handle this? Are we gonna ostracize people and shun them if they open up with us and talk about how they're living? No. Let me also take this a different direction. Because I think a lot of times when we hear messages like this, it fills us with conviction, right? It makes us feel like maybe we're dirty people. There is a lot to be said for repentance in order, in the sense that we're gonna turn our lives around and start living for God's glory. But here's the thing. The Bible says every single person has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. No one's perfect. A lot of people feel a little bit of shame when the churches talk about stuff like this. But the God I serve says, I have come to make all things new. And that's the beauty. That's the beauty of grace. You know, some of these studies, it kind of scares me. You know, like if I was someone who, you know, lived a life that wasn't honoring God with my body, like I would think to myself, well, have I forfeited an intimate marriage? No. God makes all things new. That's right. And that's Amen. the life. And that's the grace of the God we serve. I'm gonna ask everyone to close your eyes with me. All right now, the Holy Spirit may be speaking to someone this morning. It could be a word of conviction, it could be a word of hope. But right now, let's be sensitive to what God's Spirit is speaking to us here in this place. How are we gonna live this life? Are we gonna live it to bring God glory? Or are we gonna live it to try to find our own pleasure and find our own happiness? God wants the best for your life. God loves us so much that he sent his son Jesus to come to take our punishment of sin on that Roman cross. The beautiful part is, is that God says, listen, when you put faith in Jesus, guess what? He's gonna take your bill. That payment of sin, which is death, Jesus took that bill for you. And now that gift of grace is free for those who put their faith in Jesus. So this morning with every eye closed, if you've never made that decision to follow Christ, to accept his grace and love, I wanna give you that opportunity, just with a sincere heart, and your, just make this between you and God, to say, God, I believe you sent Jesus to die for me on that cross. I believe that you have the best life for me. And I know I've messed up your standard. I haven't followed your way the best I can, but right now, can I just ask that you'd come and just forgive me. Everything wrong that I've ever done, just come and make it all new. I want my slate to be clean. And for today on, I'm making a decision to follow you, to bring you glory. We pray this in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen. Come on, can we celebrate some people this morning?